the salt, please. Ta a phrase that's been heard around the tables for literally thousands of years. Believe it or not, from the beginning of time, salt has been used to enhance dishes, has been used for people to enjoy their meal a little more. Maybe some of your own homes contain a salt shaker, different sizes, different shapes. And depending on who you are, some of you like a little pinch of salt to add flavor. Some of you, maybe you like to have enough salt that once you look at that, uh, that piece of meat or those vegetables, all you can see is white. Personally, I prefer just a touch of salt. Not too much salt for me. I, I like it to be a little lighter than that. In fact, many times I just like to eat it, eat meals without the salt. But we do need some salt. In fact, I'm sure many of you have heard this before, but hopefully a little refresher on your history lesson. And that's uh, salt has been used for years as a preservative, whether it was for meat or for vegetables, things like that. The people who did not have good food storage or refrigeration, would use salt to preserve their meals. They would use salt so that they were able to save it longer and so that they wouldn't get sick from it. Well, not only has salt been used as a preservative, but it's also been used as a purifier. Believe it or not, we have records back to 6,000 BC, that's BC, before Christ, of people using salt to purify their water. Now today, of course, we just use salt and and to soften our water, but back then they didn't have the treatment we did, so they used it to purify their water. If salt was used in various religious festivals as well, but most importantly, salt is used to regulate the fluids in our body. See, people, animals, need salt in order, for their, in order to sustain life. If we didn't have salt, we would either sweat too much or we wouldn't sweat enough. We, our bodies wouldn't be able to properly process the fluids in our body. But now getting to our gospel lesson today, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus uses salt as an illustration. In fact, not just a metaphor like we might expect, you should be like salt, but notice what he says to the disciples. You are the salt of the earth. Did you notice that? It was not a, you are like the salt of the earth, you should be like salt shakers, but you are the salt of the earth. And well, what did he mean by that? Well, we just finished up with the Beatitudes. Remember last week, Matthew 5, we heard about the Beatitudes and we heard all the blessings that come from adversity. And now we have Jesus telling the disciples, you are to be salt. Well, I'm certain he didn't mean for them to be tasty condiments on the Romans' table ground up to perfection. Rather, he was encouraging them, much like salt, to be purifiers, to be preservers, and to be life sustainers, and even enhancing the lives of the world around us. And so when we think about the disciples, when we think about what Jesus was commanding them to do, their world was not so different from ours. Certainly they didn't have the internet, they didn't have TV like we have today, but they certainly had immorality like we have today. They had so much immorality in all shapes and colors that one of the things they needed to do was be the purifiers. As Christians, as followers of Christ, they needed to be there to share that gospel message. Because how else would the world know of it? Well, not only that, but they also needed to be those preservers of the faith. Keep in mind when the gospels were written, when Matthew was writing, when Mark was writing, when Luke and John were writing. Right then, already, Christian church was under persecution from the Romans. 50 AD, we're, look, we're talking about just 10 years later that Nero entered, entered the scene. And he was one of the worst, if not, well, probably one of the worst emperors who persecuted the Christians. So they had a mission to preserve the faith among those people who were there. Well, and not only that, but then that life-giving. Truly, the gospel has power. Truly, the gospel is able to save lives. Truly, the gospel is able to take us who are dead in our sins and redeem us. And that gospel is used that gospel is the message that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. That gospel then was used by the disciples to bring other people to the faith, that saving faith. So then how about us? How are we to be like salt? How can we be salty saints or flavorful followers of Christ, if you prefer? Well, I think just as the disciples were called to be purifiers, preservers, life bringers and enhancers, so also we are. Many times in the Lutheran church, 
We don't like to use that dirty word, good works. In fact, we shy away from it. Many times we'll kind of put it on the back burner. We don't want to bring it up. Well, because there's that danger that comes with it. But I think that's exactly what Jesus is telling us to do here. As saved Christians, as people who have already been redeemed, he is calling us to do those good works in our society. He is calling us to be part of our society. So certainly, he is not telling us that good works save. Certainly, I would never say that from here because no way ever could good works save us. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned and broken God's command. Our good works are nothing before God. However, that's before we are saved. For those Christians who are justified, those Christians who are made right before God, God has called us to be more than just pew sitters. He has called us to be more than people who are fed by the gospel, but he has called us to also be sharers of the gospel. He has called us to be like that salt, to be that salt in people's life, to be the purifier, the preserver, the life giver, and the enhancer. Many people today, after service, will go home. Maybe they'll get ready for big event, the Super Bowl, one of the most publicized events all year long. Many people will turn on the game to watch it, but some people will turn on the game just so they can watch the commercials. Anyone here who just turns on the game to watch the commercials? Well, I see a few people. That's true. Well, I enjoy the game personally, but you'll notice something about the commercials, and not just the Super Bowl commercials, but commercials that are on TV today that not just commercials, but TV programs today, movies that are in the theaters today. Many of these, while humorous, also promote a message that is different from what God's message says in Scripture. Many of these commercials are promoting things as seeing human beings as objects of our sexual desires rather than seeing people as human beings who God has created. Many of these commercials are pushing for avarice, that we fill ourselves with more and more. Many of these commercials... These TV shows are pushing for improper uses of alcohol, drugs, gluttony, things like that. And while many of you may not be given over to these vices, the more you watch, the more you fill your minds and your hearts with these sinful images, these sinful thoughts, the more they start to wear on you. The harder it is to be that purifier. As salt, We are to purify. Now you may say, who am I? I am but one voice. Who will listen to me? But even one voice makes a difference. Because then maybe there will be two voices. Maybe there will be five voices. Maybe there will be ten voices. Maybe then fifty, a hundred voices. And as we join together, as we stand together as Christians, pushing for what God's Word says, rather than what the world teaches, We can help to purify our society. God uses the good works through us to make changes in our world. Just consider Paul's words in Philippians chapter 2. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. As Christians who have been redeemed, God works through our lives, our lives to help purify our society. And if we do not, who will? If we are not the ones who stand up for the truth of the gospel, who will? Who is the one who will pass on the message to the next generation? Who is the one who will preserve the message for the next generation, if not us? If we are not the ones who stand tall, who are not the ones who stand strong, who are not the ones who stand up for it, however can we expect the message of the gospel, the truth of Christ, to be preserved? It's awful hard to think of that, isn't it? Because we know that if we are not the one who preserve the message of the faith, if we are not the ones who defend it and stand up for it, who will? Jesus rhetorically asks in Luke chapter 9, if a blind man leads a blind man, will they not both fall into the pit? How true it is when our world is left to guide itself, when our world, our sinful human nature is left without the precious message of the gospel. How true it is that we will not that it will not lead to life, but will lead to death. The world offers us these promises, 
The world offers us these temptations, these vices. But these are not what Christ does. Christ tells us, for I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is the message we have to the world. That is the message that Jesus has given to each of us to share with others. Not just to bottle up, but to share. Not just to preach, but to share in our actions and our deeds. Think about each of your lives. Think about where you stand. Think about, have you been that salt? What image have you shown to the world? What, 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 what message have you sent to the world? Many of you are mothers, fathers, or at least grandparents. Well, I guess you have to be grandparents if you are mothers and fathers as well. But if many of you have had the opportunity to raise children, you've had the opportunity to, to see them grow up, you've had the opportunity to lead and direct them, what influences did you see on them while they were growing up? Were they positive influences? Were, they, were the influences that the world gave something that you think that they should follow? Think about those commercials. Think about those TV programs. Think about the internet, the movies we have today. Are these examples that we want our children to, to follow? Certainly not. Certainly not. And if we are not the salt, the ones who preserve the faith, then how else will they be raised? And like I said, it's not just in the message that we preach, but in the lives that we live as well. In the lives that we live as parents. See, doing the good works of God are not simply to go to church, to read the Word, to, be, to, to evangelize, to share the Gospel. But we do the good works of God when we are those parents, those children who take care of our loved ones. We do the good works of God when we are the, even when we help that little old lady cross the street or when we help that little old man cross the street or when someone helps us across the street and we even just say something like, thank you. See, our good works, as Isaiah tells us, are nothing more than filthy rags. Filthy rags that amount to nothing. But as redeemed Christians, Christians who at one time were separated from the Lord. Christians who at one time did not know their Savior. Who now are part of His kingdom. As those redeemed Christians. God working through us. Makes those works greater than we could imagine. He uses those good things. He works through us to serve others. To care for others. As salt we do have that life-giving message as well. Certainly, we are not the message. We are not the ones. Think about a dish that you had before that had just a little too much salt on it. It overcame the taste in it. It kind of ruined the flavor. Well, as life-givers, as the ones who share that gospel message, we are not to put ourselves for it, but we are to put our Savior for it. We are to put that message that first saved us first. We are to share with people that good news that Jesus has died for them. And we know this. We know that it brings salvation because He first died for us. He first gave His life for us. He lived that perfect life. He allowed His hands to be nailed to the cross. He hung on that cross. Took the mocks and the insults. He did that for us. He did that so that we would know that we were saved. He did that so that there was no question in our heart or on our minds that we were redeemed. And He did that out of His great love for us. He did that because He loved us more than anything else in all the world. Our God, He came down and humbled Himself that we could be saved. That is the life-giving message. A message that contradicts the world's message. A message that seems peculiar, but a message that truly does bring salvation.
when we think, when we look at our lives, we know that as salt, we need that message of salvation. Because many times we don't live a life that shares that gospel message. Many times we don't tell others when something they are doing is inappropriate. And that's why we do need that forgiveness. Each and every day. To return to that cross. That life-giving message of salvation. Because at the cross, that is where the price was paid. At the cross, that is where our life was given. May this be the message. As salt that we share with the earth. May this be the message that we put aside, that we put forth and put aside all else. If you hear Paul's words today in our epistle lesson, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Christ decided, Paul decided to know nothing but the most important message of all. Paul put aside all wisdom, all, all glory that would be due Him so that the one who deserved the glory, Christ Jesus, would be glorified. It doesn't matter how much we know or how little we know. It doesn't matter if we've been a disciple of the Lord, a follower of Christ for a while or for a short time. Christ can use each of us no matter where we are in our life. He can use each of us as His flavor, flavorful followers to bring life to a nation, to bring life to people who otherwise would not know that Jesus Christ is their Savior. Let us pray. Dearest Jesus, we pray that you would be with us in all that we say and do. We pray that you would make us purifiers, that you would make us preservers, that you would make us life givers, life bringers who bring your gospel message to the lost. Help us, Lord, to be an example. Help us, Lord, to be a strong light to those who are lost, a light that points to you. Lord, we pray that as your brother Jude said, that we would always be contenders for your faith. That we would stand up. That we would preach and proclaim the good news. This we pray in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.